Welcome to Breaking It All Down, I'm Count Zero. Once again, it is time to be continue Chrono Gaming with Power, Nintendo Power, with a Nintendo Power Retrospective Part 4. And I kind of messed up. I'll explain. In the last installment of the series, I reviewed Rad Racer and Mike Tyson's Punch-Out! because they were given a moderately substantial amount of coverage in that issue of Nintendo Fun Club News. Additionally, with the earlier issues of Fun Club News before number three and the start of the new format, they'd done about ooh, three or four games um, featured per issue. I figured that they would stay about that number for the new format, because that's what you do. You, you get an increased page count and you feature more stuff. That's what happened, happens when we get to Nintendo Power, but not. I don't want to get too far ahead of my stuff. Well, um, Fun Club News number three actually only featured two games. Those two games being, well, Kid Icarus and Metroid. Punch Out and Rad Racer, on the other hand, those were little teasers as the games weren't out yet, and they were going to be featured in the issue I was going to recap today. Fun Club News number four. So this is the part where you cue the fail trum trombone at my failure to comprehend the basic things like the table of contents. So, um, since the other stuff that's covered in this issue are things that aren't already out yet, and I still want to re review some games, let's make it a double feature. So that way I can review something, it gets us a little closer to the beginnings of Nintendo Power as we know it. Yeah, that'll work. So, let's get started with Fun Club News, issue number four for winter of 1987. The cover of this issue features Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. We have a nice photograph of Iron Mike before going inside and seeing Sugar Ray Leonard's endorsement of Ring King. Moving into the issue proper, we get a dramatically more extensive write-up of Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, with brief profiles of several of the boxers, including some very, very minor hints at their tells. We also have a profile of Mike Tyson, the man, not the game character, as well as a brief teaser of the TV spot for Punch-Out. Next up is Rad Racer, with a description of each of the courses, as well as some discussion of the game's Anaglyph 3D support along with a picture of the plastic 3D glasses that you could have gotten if you were reading this issue back in 1987. It's a bit late now, though. If you want a set of anaglyph glasses now, you'll have to shell out a couple bucks on eBay or Amazon.com. In the sneak peek section, we get more information on Zelda 2: The Adventure of Link and its dual perspective gameplay. There's also more information on Pro-Am Racing, which has yet to make the shift to remote-controlled cars. Enix's RPG Dragon Warrior now officially retitled for the U.S., gets a little coverage, though at this point in the game's development, the U.S. version is set to have password support instead of using a battery backup. In the tips section, we have more information on beating The Legend of Zelda, with advice for beating every single boss in the first quest of the game, even Ganon. For Metroid, we have some advice on how to get around the game more easily through using other tactics to replicate the abilities of some other powers, like the high jump. There's also some advice for managing the treasure rooms in Kid Icarus, and a level select code for Rad Racer. This issue of the Fun Club News also features the introduction of the Top 5, which becomes the Top 20 once the Fun Club News becomes Nintendo Power. At this point, the rankings are made up entirely of first-party titles, all of which I have previously reviewed, so I'm not going to pay too much attention to this. However, what I will do is that once we get to Nintendo Power, I'll do a rundown of the game's in the ranking for that year, at the end of each year, and then any games that I haven't reviewed by that time, I will do a roundup review of those games. Speaking of reviews, we have a selection of user-submitted reviews, all of them unsurprisingly favorable. We also get our top score rankings after this, as well as more merch pictures. Again, none of this merch is on eBay, so if you have an idea of how much this stuff goes for, please post in the comments. The Letters column has more requests for advice, 
particularly for Legend of Zelda and Gradius. And we also have a request for a fan art or envelope art column. In the new hardware section, we get a look at what is, in my opinion, the neatest Nintendo aftermarket controller of the non-standard variety. And I'm not talking about the Power Glove. The controller is a hands-free sip and puff controller for people who have lost the use of their hands and at the time of this issue it's still in development by Nintendo and is in testing at the Children's Orthopedic Hospital in Seattle. This actually inspired me to do a little research to see what other controllers like this are around these days and if any of them are first party. And the answer is no, nobody is making first party sip and puff controllers like this anymore for modern consoles. There are third-party companies who make these for people who have lost the use of their hands through car accidents or, most notably in modern times, the um, through combat in Iraq or Afghanistan. So, maybe this is a niche that maybe, I don't know about Nintendo, but Sony or Microsoft might consider getting into for their next generation of consoles, or maybe even the end of this generation is some sort of first-party aftermarket sip and puff controller for people who just don't have their hands anymore. Just a thought. The issue wraps up with a solicitation for Metroid fan art and some more puzzles. After this break, we'll get started with issue number five of Fun Club News. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Our cover game for Fun Club News number 5 is RC Pro-Am. The cover also quietly marks the next major sign of the transition from Fun Club News to Nintendo Power. While the magazine was quarterly in its first year, now it is bi-monthly. Our first interior ad is from Capcom, selling Section Z and Trojan. We start up with the RC Pro-Am feature, and rare second game in the magazine. In addition to a description of the gameplay elements, we also get a look at the game's power-ups, as well as letting you know that you can get a better car by collecting letters on the track that spell Nintendo, going from the truck to the four-wheeler to the off-roader. One thing that we don't get, though, that would be helpful is track maps. As it is, this game is fairly straightforward to pick up and play, but it's a bit of a pain in the butt. First problem, the game only lets you continue twice. Normally, I wouldn't consider this much of a thing, provided it gives you some sort of continue code or cheat or something like that to let you pick up where you left off. Here, it kind of bugs me because there is no cheat to let you keep going. There is no con level select code to let you pick back up where you left off. So you're kind of screwed. Additionally, the game's camera angle really gives you very little notice on upcoming turns. It uses a top-down, semi-isometric camera angle like the one that Rares uses in a lot of their PC games and some of the other Nintendo games, and generally it's the thing that they like to do. It's one of the early hallmarks of a Rare game. Now, this angle gives you some notice of when turns are coming up, and it does give you something of an illusion of depth, um, one that games like Super Off-Road don't give, which I'll get into when I, when I get to those games later, it still makes it hard to judge your position in, on your first run through a track. While there's a mini-map on the bottom of the screen along with speed and weapon information, it's far enough from the action that taking the time to look at it to see where I am in the track, where my opponents are, and see what weapon I'm using ended up hurting my in-game performance so I ended up having to ignore it and missing out on some useful information. The obstacles in the various levels don't help things either. They suffer from some of the same problems as the turns in the game, but there is no way to look on the mini-map to see where, for example, a mud puddle or ice patch is. Um, which gives you little opportunity to maneuver around them if you can maneuver around them at all. All in all, while the game is certainly addictive and is kind of fun, it's definitely a game which can really get on your nerves on occasion. Next up is Ice Hockey. Rather than focusing on the strengths of the individual teams, instead this article gives us information on the three different types of players you can field. Fatso, who is slow but powerful, Lanky, who is fast but an inaccurate shot, and Peewee, who is kind of in the middle of the road. I'm not a fan of this game. I kind of have this weird thing when it comes to sports games where if it's a game I've played personally through Little League or high school or middle school 
sports or whatever, I tend to judge the game and my performance in the game based on how well I did when I was younger. And if I'm not doing as well in the game as I feel like I did when I was younger, if I feel like I'm worse at the game than I'd be in real life, never mind the fact that the characters in the game are pro players or what have you, it really hurts my enjoyment of the game. And that's what I ran into here with Ice Hockey. I didn't feel like I was able to accurately pass the puck from player to pl player to player, nor did I feel like I was in any way accurate in my goals in terms of aiming them. In some cases, my shot just seemed to go in some arbitrary direction, and I'm not sure if it was because I was hitting the button the wrong way, or anything else. So, since I can't get a good grasp on what I'm doing wrong, how I'm how to get the puck from the opponent, opponents and players, or get the puck from my player to other players on my team to get the shot in, it just leads to a situation where the game really doesn't work for me at all. After ads for Renegade from Taito, and upcoming titles from Tengen, we get some more information about Zelda 2, as well as, more notably, a little ad for the Bandai Power Pad, featuring stadium events. These would, of course, later become the Nin Nintendo Power, Pla Power Pad, and the Nintendo um, World Sports thing. I forget the proper title. I'll probably stick a caption on here to say what it is. Although Stadium Events did end up coming out as Stadium Events briefly, and then... Nintendo re-released the game under their own name, with Stadium Events becoming one of the most valuable Nintendo titles ever. Anyway, there's also a description of Nintendo Golf, currently titled U.S. Golf. We also have some screenshot-free blurbs for The Return of Donkey Kong and Super Mario Bros. 2, with no information whether Super Mario Bros. 2 is going to be the redone version of Doki Doki Panic, or if this is some early plans at having it be having the lost levels as we know them now getting a US release once we get past the ad for Bandai's Dragon Power the anime reference free version of Bandai's Dragon Ball game from Japan we get to the Louis Reviewee column Louis Reviewee is described as a pseudonym of a well-known video game expert and game reviewer However, I can't find any information on his real identity. I've sent an email message thing to um, Howard Phillips on Facebook to see if I can find out who he is. I may also send something to Gail Tilden, the editor-in-chief of Nintendo Power later, and who also was on the staff at this time as well, just so I can see who Louie was. But in the meantime, I got nothing. Anyway, this column is used to discuss third-party games, and at present, Louie is describing Goonies 2 from Konami. Since Louie isn't doing an actual review, I will give you one of my own. This game is basically a sequel to the Play Choice 10 Nintendo vs. System arcade-only game, The Goonies from Konami, which also tied into the film. So, this game is a bit of a pain for me to wrap my head around. As Mikey, you're supposed to find your way through the Fratelli's mansion. I presume supposed to be something like the, ho the abandoned hotel lodge that they'd hold up in in the film. Find all the goonies and then free a mermaid. The problem is I got, really got lost in this game, which is kind of impressive since the game also has a built-in map. Though not an auto-map in terms of marking where you've been previously. Um... This is kind of aggravated by a Goonie detector that you get early in the game. Sort of. When you get it, it shows you the location of the nearest Goonie. That's fine. It lets me use that information to kind of figure out, okay, where do I need to go to get there as far as plot of the path and make adjustments to it as I go through these areas for the first time and see, okay, no, I have to backtrack and go down this way and all this, that, and the other thing. The problem is, is it only shows that first Goonie. Um, which is frustrating because you have to find the Goonies to build up your health. Normally you start out with two life bars. Each Goonie you find increases your life meter by one life, additional life bar. 
Also, you go through the game, you will get new enemies who will spawn, um, including the Fratellis, who you can disable but cannot permanently defeat. Now, thus, your trip through the house ends up becoming aimless until you find another Goonie Detector, and checking after I checked online for maps for the game, it appears there's only one Goonie Detector in the game, which I find something of a major nuisance. In the Tips and Tricks column, we get some more advice for The Legend of Zelda on how to use the Warp Whistle to get to the next labyrinth that you have to get to. For Metroid, we also get the location of a hidden energy tank and a way to beat Ridley without taking damage. Rad Racer has tips on how to get yourself some non-stop turbo, and we also have some advice for each of the fighters in Punch-Out, save for Tyson himself. Konami has an interesting ad for Jackal and Contra that looks right out of an 80s action movie, which seems appropriate considering the subject matter of both of those games. Though the guys they got as models for the ad are showing some really, really poor trigger discipline in terms of finger on the trigger of the gun when you're not planning on shooting it in that direction. Yeah, I don't even own guns and I've never fired one and I know that that's bad trigger discipline. Someone should talk to their ad guys about this or something. Yeesh. After some user reviews, again, all universally favorable, we get some more user-submitted tips before we're continuing to some less wearable merch. Official Nintendo strategy guides, some of which I can actually find information about how much they cost now on eBay. The official Nintendo Player's Guide is currently running at about 15 bucks. The book How to Win at Super Mario Bros. runs around 20 to 25 bucks. And the Legend of Zelda Tips and Tactics book all of, uh, runs about, oh, 17, 18 bucks. Considering the size of these books, that's a moderately stiff price, but, I mean, these things were probably fairly limited, limited print run, more or less. There's a letters column after this, but it's one that's cut short in, in favor of something much more interesting. Photographs of people's Nintendo Halloween costumes. I particularly like the Link costumes we have here, as they're also notable that they kind of get right what fantasy attire should look like in terms of this sort of green tea tunic outfit, in that you should be wearing some sort of leggings with them. It's not like a loincloth clad barbarian outfit. Something which perhaps should have been realized by the Nostalgia Critic in the Suburban Night special, but hey, um, miniseries thing. But hey, it was for the sake of humor. I'll cut Doug Walker some slack. Please hire me. Next is a look at the NES Max controller. Now, I've never actually used the thing to play a game. However, I did manage to get my hands on one and kind of mash the buttons a little bit and kind of feel the how the buttons return and how the d-pad returns when I saw one at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo earlier in the year and I wasn't too enthused with the feel. I like the NES Advantage more. Maybe it's just the little sliding button thing in the middle threw me off. I'd have to, I guess, get loaned one or have somebody get an NES Max for me so I could try it out firsthand and really play with it to see how it works differently. So, anyway, the issue wraps up with a word search, an acrostic, and a crossword. So, if I, my pick for issue 5, since I gave my pick for issue 4 last week, or rather two weeks ago, is RC Pro-Am. Now, this is kind of a pick with caveats, because, i am be honest, I, as I mentioned, I'm not the biggest fan of RC Pro-Am. I like Rad Racer a lot more. Um, but it's a fun game. I can just sit there and play it for long periods of time. It's easy to pick up and play. It's something we can come back to easily at any point later and do fairly well at it. Whereas with the Goonies, there is a lot of kind of, I don't want to say deliberate obtuseness, but... There's obfuscation, which I find obnoxious. Um, and, well, I didn't like Isaki, as I already mentioned. So, 
RC Pro Am is my pick. If you're looking, if you're only going to buy one game that was featured in Fun Club News number five, that's the one to get. Next week, it's time for another book review, though. And today I'm taking a look at an urban fantasy novel this time, with Midnight Riot from Ben Aronovich. So I'll see you then.